Dobro večer još jednom and welcome, dobrodošli na ovo predavanje. Večeras, good evening and welcome to this lecture that we from Quantum Serbia organized together with Aleksandar Radovanović. So we have a pleasure to have Aleksandar again with us. So I would just remind that last year we had also honor to uh, have Alexander talking about uh, uh, quantum algorithms uh, based on his book Quantum Computing Illustrated. Uh, let me say just a few words about our uh, group, our community, Quantum Serbia. Uh, so we are a community of professionals and researchers and people from academia uh, based in Serbia or expatriates in living in other countries, but this community is open to all people who are not really from, from that part of the world, because we are open for collaboration, for learning uh, uh, new technologies, uh, in particular quantum technologies and quantum computing. Um, so this is a 12th event, actually, that we uh, organized since a uh, uh, few years. Um, and uh, so as uh, uh, our uh, community started uh, actively working on learning uh, quantum technologies happened uh, just at the beginning of the, this uh, COVID pandemic. So most of our events are uh, still virtual, but uh, uh, hopefully that in near future, we'll be able to organize also physical events with uh, uh, presence and uh, um, networking really where people can meet face to face. Uh, so this event today will uh, will last, the lecture will, will last for 45 minutes and then we'll have uh, 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers. So I invite everyone to gather the questions and use the chat in uh, uh, in Zoom uh, meeting to, to ask uh, at the end uh, of, of the lecture, you will be able also to unmute yourself if you would like really to uh, ask uh, verbally. So if somebody um, is uh, would like to ask in, in, in Serbian language, uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Alexander will be uh, willing, I mean, we will be able to translate or to, to answer either in, in English or in, in Serbian. Um, so uh, Alexander is uh, uh, an electri electronic engineer, computer scientist, and author. He obtained his uh, PhD at the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town. He is a founding member of the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, where he worked as a computational scientist for the last 10 years. Alexander is the author of numer numer numerous scientific publications in the book Quantum Programming Illustrated that I mentioned earlier. And uh, this book, I, I recommend it also myself. It's uh, really wonderful for starting uh, in uh, quantum computing. So Alexander is now based in Cape Town where he's uh, starting up a quantum computing institute. Uh, so Alexander, well, thank you once again for uh, being available uh, to share your, your knowledge uh, today. Uh, your the title of your lecture is very intriguing. Uh, we are talking about uh, disaster, about apocalypse. So, what is uh, going to happen, and what do we need to do? Please uh, uh, take the stage and share with us uh, your uh, your lecture. Thank you. I hope you can now see my screen. Yes, we can see. Okay, great. So uh, as announced, this talk is about the quantum apocalypse and how to survive it. So just to start, these are postcards from places uh, I worked as a computer scientist and uh, a lecturer. Uh, I'm now based in Cape Town, uh, where I'm starting uh, up, as you said, Quantum uh, Computing Institute. I'm also author of the book titled Quantum Programming Illustrated. So the term quantum apocalypse refers to the point in time when quantum computers overpower 
conventional encryption methods. Uh, just imagine the power of quantum computer. Imagine a computer which is able to correlate information faster than light or can operate with more numbers at once than the numbers of atoms in the universe. So a quantum computer is a machine that uses the properties of quantum mechanics to perform computation. So let's have a look at some of these principles which are important to quantum computing and quantum cryptography. The first principle is quantum superposition. And in the quantum world, the superposition would allow our quantum cat to be at two different states, states at the same time. Like in this example, sitting and sleeping at the same time. But in quantum computing, superposition allows processing vast amount of data at once. Quantum entanglement can be compared to twins that share the same thought, even when separated by a great distance. In quantum computing, again, entanglement enables uh, almost instant data correlation, co correlations. Uh, the no cloning theorem says that our cat is unique and cannot be duplicated. This means that quantum data cannot be copied, which is useful in eavesdropping prevention. As an illustration of quantum advantage over classical computing, Let's compare classical and quantum search algorithms. So let's say that we have a file with n equals 1 trillion of unsorted card, and the classical and the quantum computer that can check one card in one microsecond. So they operate at the same speed and without parallel processing. To find the target card, a classical computer must check uh, records randomly one by one. And in average, the target card is usually found after checking half of the cards, which will take about one week. And to perform the same task, the quantum computer of the same speed would need only one second. So in other words, it is 600,000 times faster. This speed up is achieved by checking all card cards at once and in a single step identifying the target card. Uh, some additional steps are also needed, but in total, the search result can be obtained uh, with quadratic speed up. So everything we do over the internet today, from web browsing, internet shopping, banking, social media, everything is encrypted. Uh, and the task of cybersecurity with cryptography at its core is to protect all this information from digital attacks. To protect data, uh, classical cryptography use mathematics, while quantum cryptography use the properties of quantum mechanics. In principle, a cryptographic process starts with a text message or data to which we apply a key to get a cipher text. And this process is known as encryption. In this example, a key is given as a sequence of random numbers and the message is encrypted by moving uh, the original letters forward by corresponding number given inside the key. And to get the original message back, we do the opposite, subtract key numbers from the corresponding cipher, says, cipher text letters. Uh, this simple type of encryption is called one-time PED, but in practice, we use binary numbers and decryption and decryption in that is done by XOR operation. In general, there are three types of classical cryptography and they are commonly used together. So the first one is a hash function and it got its name because it cuts up a message into small pieces and makes them into a new message of small fixed length called the hash value. And hash value should be unique to the hash data and it acts as a data fingerprints. Uh, instead of verifying data as a whole, we can verify only its hash value. In the other type, uh, in symmetric cryptography, the same key is used for encryption and decryption. The problem of symmetric cryptography is how to exchange this, the secret key. 
This problem was solved in 1970s by invention of asymmetric cryptography. So Sander Ellis creates two mathematically related key, a secret key and a public key. So red and green, this slide. Uh, she makes the public key available to everyone and which can be used to encrypt a, a message. And this encrypted message can be decrypted only by her secret key. A variation of this scheme is the key encapsulation mechanism or CAM, uh, which is specifically designed for key exchange. Uh, in CAM, Bob uses Alice's public key to generate a sh shared secret key here in gold. Uh, he keeps and a ciphertext he sent back to Alice. So Alice decrypt this ciphertext with her secret key to get the same shared key as Bob. Caches are irreversible, but hackers can still find a pattern that produces the same hash as the original data. It is like finding another person that has the same fingerprint as you. This graph shows how many times a classical and a quantum computer managed to break a small six bits hash in 200 trials. Uh, green graph shows success rate of a classical computer, which is about 15%. And the orange graph shows success rate of quantum computer, which is about 70%, 75%. Hashes we use today, like SHA-256, are considered safe, but even small text tests like this one shows that they won't be quantum safe in the near future. Let's have a look at a scenario in which Alice and Bob's data centers exchange data over public data network. Uh, data is usually encrypted by advanced encryption standard or AES. And since AES use the same key for encryption and decryption, Alice must send her key to Bob. This is today usually done by using RSA, Diffie-Hellman or elliptic uh, curve exchange protocols. Of course, everything is done automatically and we use Alice and Bob to represent two software entities. Uh, we'll have a look at AES and RSA as typical symmetric and asymmetric algorithms and how safe they are in presence of quantum computers. AES algorithm is quite complex, but in brief, data is split into blocks of four by four bytes and each block undergo number of substitution, reshuffling and block encryption. Since AES algorithm is known to everyone, security of encryption depends on a key security. In cryptography, this is well known uh, Kirchhoff's principle. In a brute force uh, quantum attack to AES, attacker first need to obtain sample pairs of plain text and cipher text. Uh, these samples can be obtained from expected sequence of bytes from found in the common data files, for example, MS Word, Excel, email, and the like. And knowing these pairs, attacker can now use quantum algorithm to perform exhaustive search to obtain the secret key. At the moment, uh, the best candidate for exhaustive search is the search algorithm I briefly described in the beginning. And this algorithm is named after its inventor, Lowe Grover. The algorithm provides quadratic speed up comparing to a classical one. And this table shows effective key size for AES algorithm in presence of quantum computers. In essence, key security is halved. And according to US National Security Agency, you know, infamous NSA, uh, the top secret protection drops below the secret level. A simpler remedy, at least for now, is to increase the key size to 512 bits. Uh, theoretically, a key can be increased even more, but the algorithm speed will be affected. Uh, the speed of AES is measured in gigabits per second, and just by switching from 128 bits to 256 bits, speed drops by 40%. Uh, 
we can say that AS256 is at least at this moment uh, quantum resistant. But the problem we are facing today is a secret key exchange via symmetric protocols like RSA. Asymmetric protocols require two mathematically related keys, the public key for encryption and the private key, which is used for decryption. Uh, in this example, Bob creates this pair of keys. He keeps the private key and sends his public key to Alice. Alice, who wish to say hello, use this key to encrypt her message and then send it back to Bob. After receiving the message, Bob used his private key to decrypt it. In this process, eavesdropper Eve can freely make a copy of Bob's public key. Bob is not worried since no classical computer can break this key. The security of a symmetric key is based on a mathematical principle called one-way function. And by using this function, keys are easily generated, but hard to break. Uh, for example, the RSA algorithm is based on simplicity of multiplication and difficulty of factoring. In this simplified example, Alice takes numbers three and five to be her secret numbers and their product, which is 15, to be the public key. The same numbers in different formula are also used to generate uh, her secret key. Having the public key, in order to find the secret key, Eve must recover the secret number as factors of number 15, which is more difficult task than multiplying three by five. Of course, instead of small numbers like 15, today we use uh, 2048 bits keys, uh, which cannot be factorized in a reasonable time. The RSA could be broken uh, by using a quantum factorization algorithm developed by a mathematician, Peter Shor. As shown on this graph to break uh, 1048 bits key, the best classical number field sieve algorithm would require about a billion years. But the short algorithm running on a powerful quantum computer would require about 100 seconds. The graph also shows that uh, increase, increasing number of bits doesn't significantly increase security. So far, uh, the largest number factored by a quantum computer has only eight decimal digits, and it has been factored by modified Grover's algorithm. At this moment, Shor's algorithm is still in domain of theory but it has been estimated that we would need about 20 million qubits to break RSA uh, 2048 in eight hours. This table summarizes uh, impact of quantum computing on current crypto system. As you see, hash functions and AES can be made quantum safe by increasing key sizes, but asymmetric uh, key cryptography could be broken in the near future. Uh, as a temporary measure, the US National Institute of Science and Technology, or I call it NIST, is working on so-called post-quantum or quantum resistant cryptography. However, the Y2Q or years to quantum countdown has already begun. And the deadline for upgrading or replacing current crypto systems is set to I think 14th of April, 2030. According to this timeline, AES will be usable till end of the decade. So 14th of April, 2030, while uh, asymmetric uh, system should be replaced by 2025. Uh, NIST is expected to release new quantum resistance standard by the end of this year. And the standard will include the lattice code and polynomial system that should be quantum resistant for some time. At the top of this graph, we see the progress of quantum hardware measured in quantum bits or qubits. And with only 127 qubits, quantum computers today doesn't represent threat to cryptography. But IBM recently announced that they will release 4,000 qubits computer by 2025 
and by the end of decade, we will have machines with more than million qubits, which could mark the end of the era of uh, classical cryptography. Today, we have three major tools to prepare for the quantum apocalypse. The first tool is a quantum-based random key generator. The second tool are quantum resistant algorithms. Uh, these are still classical algorithms, but with improved security. And the third tools are quantum key distribution systems. These are true quantum devices that can replace classical asymmetric protocols. The first tool, quantum random generators, uh, as a source, uh, sources for cryptographic keys are all, already available and can be used in phones, cars, houses, and data centers. Uh, for example, Samsung quantum phones are using ID Quantic quantum random generator chip. And this chip uses uh, a special LED as a source of uh, randomness. Second tool. Uh, and this is an example of quantum resistant algorithm choose, chosen by NIST, which is named Kyber, uh, which is again named by uh, after fic fictional uh, crystals that power light swords in uh, Star Wars. I will just outline the algorithm, so don't worry about the mathematical details. So Kyber is based on polynomial algebra, but you can think of the variable x just as a placeholder for coefficients which are shown in red. The algorithm starts with generating a random public matrix of polynomial A and a random secret vector S, which will be our secret key. To their product, we add a vector E as a salt and get another vector T. By doing this, we produce a private key S and two components, public key uh, uh, consisting of the matrix A and the vector T. Let's say we wish to encrypt this binary sequence. First, we convert it into a polynomial by simply attaching powers of X to every bit. This polynomial is then multiplied by some big integer. Just for example, I use nine. And to create two component ciphertext, we apply formulae shown here. In the formulae, we add, we add again some random small polynomials R, E1, and E2. To decrypt uh, this uh, ciphertext, then we use this blue formula. And after the calculation, uh, all added errors will have small coefficients which are, which are simply ignored. As you can see, uh, post-quantum cryptography is quite complicated. And in my opinion, this is a sign that we need a, a fresh approach to encryption. The other problem with post-quantum cryptography is that none of the classical algorithms can be mathematically proven as safe. Uh, in general, classical cryptography is associated with risks which include progress in computing power, both classical and quantum, and development of new classical and quantum algorithms. In other words, the classical cryptography is reaching its practical limit and the paradigm shift offered by quantum mechanics is welcome. The easiest transition to quantum cryptography is to replace key exchange algorithm by quantum counterpart called quantum key distribution or QKD. And the major advantage of QKD over classical crypto systems is in replacing mathematics by laws of quantum mechanics, which theoretically guarantee unconditional security. I say theoretically because the quantum hardware cannot be perfect. QKD transmits data uh, in a binary form by encoding bits into polarized particles of light or photons. Uh, polarization simply means that the electric field of a photon is oscillating in one plane. 
So horizontal polarization encoder bit zero into quantum bit or qubit cat zero. And to denote qubits, we use so-called bracket notation, which uses a vertical bar and a right angle character. And in this context, you can think of bracket notation just as label for, for polarized photons. Uh, vertical polarization encode bit one is qubit cat one. And alternatively, a bit zero is encoded by plus diagonal polarization into qubit cat plus. And bit one is encoded by minus diagonal polarization into qubit cat minus. Qubits cat zero and cat one form a standard basis and qubits cat plus and cat minus form so-called diagonal basis. Now, a quantum encryption is nothing more than a random change of basis during binary data transfer. So let's say that Alice is sending AES key to Bob and to encode a bit in a standard basis, she uses horizontal or vertical polarization filters. To encode a bit in diagonal basis, she uses plus or minus diagonal polarizers. Bob can detect the bit correctly only if he uses the same polarizer as Alice. In addition, uh, Bob has only one chance to measure a photon. Uh, according to laws of quantum mechanics, after photon is measured, it collapses to a definite state, which is consistent with the measurement results result. And if the measurement ends with an incorrect value, it is not possible to correct result with the second measurement. This also means that the potential eavesdropper by intercepting the transmission will be collapsing photons and introducing errors which Alice and Bob can detect. Uh, from this diagram, you may say that we didn't achieve much since Alice still need to transmit information to Bob which polarizers to use for each of the bits. But quantum, mecha quantum mechanics has another trick up its sleeve. As horizontal and vertical polarizers are mutually exclusive, uh, Bob can combine them into one instrument uh, that detects horizontal, horizontally or vertically polarized photons as zero or one. So if an incoming photon has horizontal polarization, it will be detected as bit zero. If a photon has a vertical polarization, it will be detected as a bit one. But what happens if the photon is diagonally polarized? This type of polarization is in quantum mechanics treated as a geometrical sum of cat zero and cat one, we call the superposition. So instead of detecting nothing, Bob will randomly detect either zero or one component with the same probability. And the same applies for a minus diagonal polarization. Bob can also turn the instrument for 45 degrees, so he can now measure photons which are diagonally polarized. A cat plus photon is now correctly detected, same as cat minus photon, but cat zeros are half of the time detected as zeros and half of the time as ones, and the same applies for cat one. In summary, uh, when Bob measurement basis is the same as the encoding basis, he will correctly detect bits. If Bob measure in a different basis, he will make 50% error. In addition, Bob cannot place one instrument behind the other as quantum mechanics allows only one measurement in one of the possible orthogonal basis, which something which is called Heisenberg uh, principle. Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Based on described photon properties, uh, in uh, 1984, uh, Bennett and Brassard theoretically developed a quantum key distribution protocol known as BB84. And this protocol is only now entering the commercial use. In the first step of this protocol, Alice 
send her key as a stream of randomly polarized photons. Bob receives the photons and not knowing what uh, basis Alice was using, measured them in a random basis. So he randomly chose standard or diagonal. Statistically, half of the time he will be using wrong basis, which means that half of his measurement will not match the bits Alice is uh, sending. In the third step, Alice and Bob publicly exchange information about basis they were using. So not bits, but basis. They now discard all bits from their keys, which are associated with the bases that do not match. What happens if Eve Dropper's Eve intercepts Alice's uh, transmission? Uh, because of non-cloning theorem, Eve cannot copy photons without destroying them. The only choice she has is to perform so-called man in the middle attack by reading photons and creating and sending new ones to Bob. But because she doesn't know in what basis to read, she will make mistakes half of the time. As a result, new photons she will be forwarding to Bob will be half of the time incorrect. And this affects Bob reading error rate, which won't be 50% anymore, and it will be easily detected. Let's say that Alice is sending a short 8-bit uh, AES key. She randomly encodes bit into polarized photons and send them to Bob. Bob use a random filter to decode photons and construct what is known as a raw key. Bob and Alice now exchange and compare bases and remove bits from their keys, keys uh, uh, with non-correlated bases. This process is known as the key sifting. And the result of this process is a bit sequence known as a sifted key. Uh, finally, uh, intruder detection is performed by comparing few bits from the sifted key and having matching bases, but non matching bits is an indication that, that uh, there was an eavesdropper on the line. Another type of protocols are entanglement based protocol. Uh, in 1991, a physicist Arthur Eckert from Oxford developed a protocol he named E91. In E91 scenario, Alice and Bob each receive one of uh, the entangled photon pairs sent from a satellite, let's say. Uh, like in the example of twin cats that share the same thought, these two photons are correlated. So when Alice measures her photons, she can be sure that Bob will get the same result. Measurement results will be random, which is in this case an advantage as they need a random key. Uh, as an example of entangled photon generator, generator the title the slide shows a spooky one nano satellite. Uh, the satellite was launched in 2019 and is just 30 centimeters long. Uh, the name Spooky One refers to the Einstein comment about entanglement, which he called the spooky action at a distance. Uh, you can understand why if you notice that uh, there is no link uh, between Alice and Bob, uh, but they are still getting correlated results. This is one of the unsolved mystery of quantum mechanics. Another bigger satellite is Chinese uh, Nisius satellite. And Chinese plan to launch more of these satellites uh, by 2030. And uh, there are a lot of experiments going on now. Back to Earth. This is an example of practical use of QKD uh, devices uh, made by a Swiss company, ID Quantique. And QKD boxes uh, are simply plugged into ADVA interfaces that connect data centers and are configured to take over the RSA protocol. And ADVA interfaces are used because they provide the best interoperability between vendors and the speed over 400 gigabits per second. Uh, QKD boxes themselves use dedicated single mode fiber link to exchange key. When it comes to software integration, 
QKD can be integrated into various services running on four OSI uh, layers. And the most commonly encryption is done on the physical layer using optical transfer network and wavelength, uh, wavelength division multiplexing. QKD also supports various vendors. If you're using Cisco equipment, the good news is that Cisco XE IOS supports uh, QKD protocol. I mentioned that laws of quantum mechanics guarantee unconditional, secu unconditional security, but uh, quantum devices are not perfect. Uh, uh, hardware flaws can be exploited by so-called side channel attack. In this example, uh, a malicious ins uh, insider with the access to the equipment was injecting its own laser through QKD devi devices ventilator uh, holes. And the attacker was uh, measuring small interference between two laser beams and was able to reconstruct up to 60% of data without obstructing the communications. This quite complicated setup was tested uh, in a university lab, and at least for now, it is closer to a spy movie scenario than to the real life. Uh, in addition, because of optical cable errors, data is often repeated. Uh, so we cannot be sure if a data was not received correctly uh, due to cable errors or because of, of eavesdropper's presence. Uh, the simpler remedy is to repeat the whole transmission if the error rate is over an established limit. Just to mention a few of recent QKD uh, deployments. One was linking headquarters of a major EU financial institution with uh, their disaster recovery center. The other example is from UK. It shows a link between Cambridge and British Telecom at Astral Park campus. An ongoing project is a Paris quantum communication infrastructure. Uh, it involves uh, linking 10 of companies and uh, institutions. Uh, Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center recently launched 380 kilometers UKD link to Holland's capital as part of the national quantum network infrastructure. And one of the biggest projects is building European quantum communication infrastructure as a base for the future quantum internet. Our journey to quantum safety, safety can be summarized into uh, four steps. The first step is to apply quantum random number generator to ensure true randomness uh, for your keys. For example, ID Quantic supply these generators as chips, small boards, or on USB. The second step is to be crypto agile uh, by applying solutions that can be quickly replaced uh, without significant uh, changes to the IT infrastructure. The third step is to apply quantum resistant algorithms by following missed recommendations. And the fourth step is replacing classical key exchange protocol with quantum key distribution. This can be relatively easily done on a hardware level by using devices made by companies like Cats, IDQ, or Toshiba. And this brings us to the full end-to-end -end quantum safe infrastructure. Now I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, well, thank you very much, Alexander. It was a, a lot of uh, a lot of information. Uh, we can see that the technology is progressing. Uh, on one hand, maybe not as fast as we would like, <laughs> but the other side, uh, very fast, you know, for those who are thinking actually how to protect against uh, potential quantum uh, crypto analytic uh, capabilities. So uh, thanks a lot once again. And uh, uh, yeah, so this now is open for questions. Uh, please feel free to type your question in uh, um, 
uh, in the chat. Uh, I'm going to read, uh, or if you like, uh, of course, you can. Uh, uh, I can open uh, for all of you who who would like to to ask. I can open also the microphone so that you can uh, voice uh, uh, this yourself. So uh, we have the first question from Janana. How fast can technology, uh, the development of quantum computers, follow most recent theoretical findings on quantum computing? Which method of reading the quantum information has shown to be most reliable so far? I'm familiar with ion traps, but can they currently keep up with classical computers since the maximum number of qubits it can be working with is approximately five, if not mistaken. Um, so Yes, the current technology is uh, 127 qubits uh, on IBM uh, Q and the other uh, others are catching up. And um, so far the uh, theory was uh, uh, about 20 years ahead <laughs> of, uh, of uh, technology. As we can see uh, from development, the first hardware, the first theoretical ideas were 1980s, and then the first quantum, or let's say semi-quantum computer was built 2010 by uh, a Canadian company, D-Wave, and the first one we got only 2016, universal quantum computer. So actually it's uh, like uh, 40 years. <laughs> uh, but the, the things are speeding up. And uh, an example is, uh, IBM announced uh, just at the beginning of the year that they will have a 1,000 uh, qubit uh, computer by uh, uh, 2025. And a few months later, they say, OK, it seems uh, that things are going faster, and we will have 4,000 qubits by 2025. And they say they will have like a, a million qubits uh, by 2030. And I expect uh, probably, <laughs> hopefully, it will be maybe 10 millions. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, to break RSA by using Shor's algorithm, uh, you would need, uh, uh, according to recent paper, 20 million noisy qubits. So you don't even need a perfect uh, quantum computer. But at the moment, uh, Shor algorithm can, I think the biggest number it can break is 21. So <laughs> it's, uh, uh, we need at least a couple of thousands qubits to uh, follow follow up what the theory suggested. So I would say maybe 10, 15 years behind mm. the, the, the actual uh, hardware behind the theory. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for the question. Excellent question. <laughs> okay. So uh, Alexander, you, you mentioned this, uh, the largest number that was factored 21. Uh, Yes, by Shor's algorithm, but uh, yes. they factor uh, Grover's by using Grover's algorithm. I think fifty-six thousand something. That was the biggest uh, number. But they use modified Grover's algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Well, my question would be actually, why is it so complicated and difficult to factor larger numbers with now these latest quantum computers? You, you have mentioned that IBM has launched one hundred twenty-seven qubits and. The problem is uh, is the depth of uh, so-called depth of quantum circuits. So short algorithm requires, I won't go into detail, by some, something which is called quantum Fourier transform, which uh, uh, more the bigger number we want to factor, the number of, of, of uh, quantum gates, which quantum circuit consists grows exponentially. And uh, the currently quantum computer can handle maybe few hundred gates. So it's simply impossible to, to uh, code uh, more than <laughs> uh, factoring number 21. So you just don't have enough uh, resources in a, in, a, in a quantum computer to do it. Yeah, 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 OK. Uh, we have another question from uh, Slobodan Cicic, who is asking how, you, how useful is actually these uh, huge numbers of qubits, the many problems with coherence. Yeah, I think that's uh... okay. But the, the problems are uh, kind of solving on the fly. Uh, there is a problem with uh, the coherence. I think it's about you know, 90 seconds. So it means nanoseconds, uh, which means that uh, you must finish your comp computation in a matter of nanoseconds. Otherwise, uh, you lose everything. 
but technology is getting better and I see now the new IBM uh, hardware they are building, uh, they use uh, parallel uh, QPUs, quantum processing units. So I guess this, this will uh, help a lot. And uh, maybe some promising, uh, uh, Microsoft uh, is uh, working on some promising uh, theory for a completely brand new approach to quantum computing based on the not theory. Uh, but that's very, very far down the line. And these qubits will be completely uh, immune to the coherence or errors. Yeah. You mean uh, Majorana topologically? Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. So they are working on that since years, but uh, still. Uh, but recently, it has been proven that the, the physical process is possible, but uh, we don't still have it yet. So. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I, I was also thinking, well, what do you think, how, um, uh, actually, how, does the speed of the quantum computer operations matter in these cryptanalytic tasks? You know, you have a, a superconducting circuits, they are very, very fast. I mean, the operations, they last nanoseconds. Uh, you can't go more. They have files. <laughs> well, okay, not one or two nanoseconds, but they can ask uh, shorter than microseconds. But also you have trapped ions, for example, when you're using laser to move uh, these ions, you know, from one position to another, then it takes longer. So does it matter actually the, the speed of uh, how these operations are executed? I'm, according to this, uh, as the state of technology stands now, I don't think it matters because just by using uh, uh, quantum processes, it's uh, much faster. So the, the trick is in using the superposition and interference, so which is uncomparable faster than uh, classical computing. But of course, if you're using two specific types of problems, if you try to add uh, one plus one, you will uh, end up with result three in five seconds, so yeah. <laughs> which is not very good. But uh, if you're using for a task like machine learning, it has been proven that it's much more uh, efficient than uh, classical computing. Yeah. Because, they, because in machine learning and in predictions, like I said, uh, uh, modeling uh, molecules or uh, financial uh, uh, stock market, uh, it's more closer to quantum computing because it's probabilistic by itself. So. But if you want some deterministic uh, result, like finding logarithm of mm. five digit numbers, that might be a problem. Yeah. yeah. But that's why today's uh, quant, let's call it quantum computers are not really quantum. All computers we're using today are hybrid computers. And when you program a quantum computer by using a Python, you basically want it or not, you, you are mixing quantum and uh, classical programming and then, you dedicate a certain task, let's say factorization. Uh, uh, you make it as a function which will be executed on a quantum computer. And when you submit your task, let's say to IBM, you cloud. So the cloud will automatically uh, uh, execute the uh, classical part on the classical uh, computer and the quantum on the class, uh, quantum computer. So. This reminds me maybe of the situation we had a long time ago in 1980s when uh, uh, Intel started making uh, 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 floating point CPUs. So you can buy a PC, but uh, only uh, the Intel processor su supported only integer calculation. And if you want to do some heavy floating point calculation, then you, you buy uh, additional CPU. Now they are in one. But I think that's the, the same thing, which uh, same path quantum computing is follow, following. So mm, yeah. uh, you have kind of integration of quantum and classical. And uh, uh, I saw recently the IBM, IBM is uh, planning now to uh, start designing the first quantum supercomputer, which will have a quantum core and uh, uh, all other devices will be uh, classical. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Alexander. So next question is uh, coming from Luka Nedimovic. May we ask general questions about quantum computing and education? So Luka, yes, uh, feel free uh, to type in in, uh, uh, in the chat. So we have uh, about eight minutes or 10 minutes <laughs> to cover uh, this. Then we have uh, a comment from Daniel. Thanks, very interesting. I did my honors thesis 2018 on this subject, but it was incredibly rud rudimentary, but I will get your book. And Maya, yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Radovanovic, for all the info and great presentation. Love your book. So I can join. Thank also. you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sasha Markovic, he says, uh, just a comment. Reminds me of the days when I was introduced to object-oriented programming, C++. At the time, no one had a clue what was going on, and compilers were scarce. In no time, it just took off and hard when compilers were ready. I think quantum computing will be around us very sooner than we expect. Um, Yes. yes, you're right. It's all, it's already here. As uh, I mean, you can uh, uh, you can free access to IBM Cloud, and if you have some money, then or to the company, you can access uh, Amazon or Microsoft Cloud. They also support quantum computing. Yeah. Okay. And now, yeah, this is uh, this is great question, Luca. Uh, what would you suggest when it comes to education and quantum computing? Would pursuing a uh, Computer science degree in Serbia, CS, I assume computer science degree in Serbia, Faculty of Technical Sciences, Novi Sad, for example, will be good enough for research opportunities in the future and generally a quantum computing career. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure about uh, University of Novi Sad, but uh, I will be offering uh, a quantum computing course on uh, uh, MSc level at uh, uh, I don't know what, the, what, what they call it in English, but it's Rachunarski Fakultet in Belgrade. So mm -hmm. facu probably Faculty of Computer Science. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, from the, I think the course, course starts in, uh, in November, if enough people uh, apply for this degree in, in the quantum computing. But I, I think it's worthwhile of pursuing uh, as a career. Yeah. I would join that. But I mean, I'm, of course, I'm biased. So, <laughs> <laughs> but these actually educational programs are still very rare. I mean, I, I I know that there are a couple of master degrees in in Western Europe. Uh, this is just emerging field, and so uh, it's very complicated, and it's also multidisciplinary. I mean, there is physics, there is uh, math, there is computational computer science, so. What I'm trying in my course actually to reduce the number, uh, the the amount of uh, mathematics and physics. Yeah. Uh, like uh, probably in 1960s, I don't know, I'm not that old, but uh, uh, classical computer computing was full of mathematics and algorithm, complicated algorithms for let's say calculated, uh, I don't know, uh, Fourier transforms or some other complicated mathematical stuff. But now. Uh, you don't need much math to uh, start programming and to pursue a degree in, in let's say, classical computing. So I'm trying to uh, introduce something like that to quantum computing. So uh, less maths and physics mm. and uh, more uh, real uh, algorithms and, uh, and uh, programming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the approach to education in quantum computing has become more agile. Actually, actually, yes, and uh, what uh, that what actually kept, happened to quantum physics, if you studied quantum physics like 10, 20 years ago, uh, you will mostly study Schrodinger's uh, integrals and uh, all these complicated Greek letters. And now, actually, uh, even uh, teaching of quantum mechanics uh, moved uh, to teaching quantum mechanics by use uh, qubits. Mm, yeah. Okay. It's uh, easier to grasp the concept. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Luka Dimovic, uh, I have completed on uh, Inost, Inost, I N O S T, last year, and created a quantum computing workbook tutorial in Serbian. I believe it was the first one in Bosnia and Herzegovina, or at least in the Republic of Srpska. So I'm just curious. Well, Luka, uh, contact me, please. Uh, and uh, I'm curious to learn about. Yes, that's great. Yes. Talk about you know what it is exactly, and uh, 
yeah, let's continue this discussion. So uh, I sent this uh, the links uh, in the chat on how you can uh, each of you can uh, join our community. But Luca, you can also. Uh, I think I forgot. Also, we have a group in LinkedIn, so you just search for us and uh, feel free to connect uh, with me, and we'll be in contact uh, to understand uh, what this is about exactly. So, uh, I have a I have a question, uh, Alexander. Uh, so, how can one develop a business around quantum safe encryption? I mean, there is a lot of uh, a lot of news, you know, a lot of uh, uh, people talking about this, you know, crisis or pending uh, problem, a big problem. So, so what can we do? I mean, practically, so is uh, we develop something, some solutions? Is this more kind of on the hardware side or software? You know, what what can somebody do about this? Develop some As I startup suggested in my. Uh... Let me just go here. Okay. <laughs> so uh, to develop a, a business, but uh, in a, a quantum crypto systems, basically you have two routes. Uh, the one is uh, two paths. Uh, one is uh, following the NIST and their recommendation of using quantum safe cryptography, which is classical cryptography, which uh, many companies do, but uh, I think uh, most of these solutions will be uh, incorporated into new versions of operating systems from uh, uh, mobile phones to, uh, to desktop computers to data centers. So, uh, and the other path is uh, to, let's say, to be kind of consultant and help people uh, uh, implement uh, uh, hardware solutions, for example, um, by using equipment like a from a Swiss company, uh, ID Quantique, for example, uh, they offer the complete hardware solution for for key uh, uh, quantum key distribution. So um, uh, I don't see there is a much opportunity as develop its own uh, uh, software solutions because. Uh, at the end, you must comply by NIST because everyone is complied by NIST, even if you want, if you even if you have something better. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's it's it's. Uh, I guess it's not easy to uh, go beyond consultancy, mm -hmm. and if you go to hardware path, then uh, you need a lot of money. I guess. Mm. Yeah. Okay. 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 Good to know. So continue learning, and. Uh doing the research on, on what's going on with the technology and the problems around us. So, okay. Uh, what I found uh, again as the problem is uh, uh, this cloud computing. Uh, <laughs> everyone is uh, moving on a cloud. At the end, uh, you will have very few data centers. Everyone will sit uh, on at home with a laptop <laughs> connecting to cloud. Okay, still it will be companies uh, like research institutions or banks or uh that kind of institution that they, they need uh their own data centers but uh, uh but actually even banks they are moving to cloud so uh again then if you want to do some uh, kind of consultancy to this company it will be more <laughs> level of uh social engineering uh, uh and less on a hardware on a, on a software mm -hmm. level okay because because uh, actually what I, I remember from your one of your slides, you know, Samsung, I mean, already this is coming to edge devices, you know, edge technologies, they will definitely start including. Yeah, Samsung, uh, uh, and there is also some, uh, and I can't remember the name, Vietnam, Vietnamese company, they released this uh, Samsung quantum phones, they use uh, uh, ID Quantic uh, chip, which is used for uh, uh, generating the uh, quantum uh, which qu quantumly <laughs> generates uh, random numbers, which uh, gives you uh, AES key, and AES is the core of uh, today of all uh, uh, cryptography. Uh, uh, it gives you very secure and uh, very good quality key. So the problem with this uh, uh, hardware quantum uh, generators, I don't know, maybe people uh, remember 
the thing is going since 210 when Intel first time released the uh, uh, hardware uh, random number generator as a part of the Intel chip. And a few years after Snowden <laughs> uh, actually revealed that uh, uh, there are some back doors to, uh, to this hardware. So uh, you generate your AES key hoping that you have secure, good quality uh, uh, random number key. And meanwhile, NES could just uh, pick up that key and no matter what kind of complicated algorithm or secure channel you use, if the key is stolen at the level of random numbers, you don't have a chance. Mm. So, and even later, the uh, and many people now even they don't use. Uh, I think it's called a RUNT function, which is built into uh, Intel chips because uh, guys <laughs> from NIS and uh, probably similar three letters agencies, uh, but. Uh, uh, IDQ chip, I think is quite secure, but uh, the best level of security, I would say, uh, uh, comes from the entanglement. So if you use an entanglement scheme, you get your random number key and uh, uh, you can use equipment uh, which you, you don't need to trust because you can calculate, uh, is there uh, any, any fiddling? Uh, uh, going on behind the scene. So uh, you can use uh, untrusted equipment from any any provider. And very quickly by simple, uh, something which is called belt theorem, you can mm. prove yeah. uh, is these numbers are really, or is these uh, particles are, or qubits are really entangled or someone is actually uh, faking these entangled qubits. So. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. I mean, it's, it... It's, uh, also, it's in, uh, another interesting thing, which is on the different level. For example, even if you use IDQ chip, and let's say WhatsApp, uh, they have uh, they guarantee end-to-end -end encryption. But then the other day, I read that they are using uh, about uh, one thousand moderators to check messages. So if it's end-to-end -end encryption, so <laughs> what does the moderator read? <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. So it's, yeah, well, it's very complex issue, but uh, uh, I mean, what what you just say here now is it, it confirms, you know, this this statement from earlier that uh, being a consultant actually and working on that side uh, provides very good insights, you know, what the problems are and how to deploy and to apply all these uh, different products now that they are available and technologies. Okay. Um, there is another very uh, interesting question. So uh, uh, from Daniel, I remember Google also tried to build quantum computers. Who will win the race to supremacy, uh, quantum supremacy, IBM, or are there other plays in the players in the in the this race? I will say that you have uh, uh, IBM. I think the IBM is leading at the moment. Uh, I on Q. Uh, you have Honeywell is also working on it, uh, and uh, there are also some other companies. And I would say the moment IBM is leading uh, again is if Microsoft succeed in. A, I don't really, I'm not really much in favor of Microsoft, but <laughs> they might succeed in building quantum computer on completely new physical processes. Maybe uh, that will win. Sadly. Uh, uh, D Wave, who was the first in this technology, uh, now it's switching to uh, the uh, quantum circuits, and they have uh, different kind of uh, quantum computers, which was some people say it wasn't real quantum. But uh, it's a good question, but it's 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 hard to predict because uh, mm -hmm. uh, the the technology is uh, basically still in the beginnings, yeah, and many people try many, many things. But at the moment, these uh, superconducting circuits, uh, which IBM is using, it's, it's, it's currently seems the best solution for now. Okay. I have also another <laughs> question that goes in, in this direction. Uh, how possible is that uh, 
military in different countries have programs that are much more advanced than those publicly announced and available that we are not aware of, but basically, what do you think? Uh, Oh, definitely, especially Chinese military. So uh, they already have a number of satellites. They use uh, quantum encryption and uh, QKD over satellite. And uh, uh, if you look the investment, uh, I think it's uh, maybe five to 10 times uh, bigger than investment or the second next investment in quantum computing technology. So they're quite secretive. We don't really know what they are doing, but... Uh, uh, they're not secretive uh, when it comes to investment. So uh, I guess that money pays off somewhere. Okay. And uh, on the West, I think uh, uh, Europe is quite strong in, in quantum computing and uh, Switzerland, for example, uh, traditionally, I guess, in, uh, in optical instruments and QKD, which is optically based. And, uh, uh, and in, in theory, Oxford University, like uh, David Deutsch recently got this, uh, Price. Uh, yeah. So, it's like last week, he's so-called father of quantum computing. He he was first who proved that the quantum computer computing is possible theoretically in uh, 1982. I think it was his first paper. So, I think things are speeding up, and uh, I would say maybe Chinese are leading, but we don't have a clue what they are doing. <laughs> okay. Okay. And also the other thing is, is it's, it's uh, they're leading maybe in the military applications. This mm -hmm. also people, all these agencies and military, we know they're all spying on each other. And uh, uh, it's time maybe now to steal the data if you need some data and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, decrypt them later when the quantum computing uh, becomes uh, available. So many of them, they are just accumulating data which can't do much with it because they can't decrypt it. But everyone is hoping that uh, in 10 years or maybe less, uh, the quantum computer will be powerful enough to break usually AES encryption, which is used to encrypt files. Yeah, okay, true. Well, we'll see the future will bring many news and interesting things. Okay, very good. Um, so, uh, Alexander, well, thank you once again for, for your time and for uh, sharing uh, your knowledge uh, with all of us. Um, I'd you. like also to thank all of you who joined uh, this, uh, uh, this lecture. Um, feel free to join our community uh, and uh, um, We'll stay in contact. We'll let you know about the next events that we are planning. Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Thank you all.